All right, guys. Hello, and welcome to our new chapter. This is Ecosystem Dynamics. Um, we're going to learn the basics of how ecosystems are set up. Um, in or, and it may be a review for some of you guys. Um, like we're going to do food webs and and um, you know the geosphere and the atmosphere. We're going to do some of that to review for you guys, but we need to learn how ecosystems are set up in order that we can protect them more from humans, which is what environmental science is about. So to, so within this chapter, we're learning the basics of how ecosystems work in order that we can protect them more. All right. Um, so to start off with, we have a case study that goes over the disappearing Amazon forest, and we know that um, anytime we think of natural habitats that we need to protect, the rainforest comes in top among the list of one of the things we need to protect. It's not the only one, but it's one of the big ones because um, they, they take up only a tiny bit, like 7% of the whole Earth's surface. Okay, you got the whole Earth. They're the, uh, worldwide, they are only 7% of the Earth's surface. But within that tiny 7%, you have well over half of the entire living things on the earth live within that 7%, okay? More than half of the, the different types of living things in the world live within that tiny 7%. So we need to work very hard to protect it. That's called biodiversity. We need to protect the biodiversity, all of those different living things. Um, and what's happening is that the human activities have disturbed or destroyed more than half of the forests. So it's supposed to cover only 17%, and we've already destroyed more than half of that, more than 7%, and we've destroyed half. So what happens then is we lose all that biodiversity, all of those different possible animals that live in the rainforest. We lose all of that. Um, cutting down the trees of the rainforest has also accelerated atmospheric warming because what the trees do for us is they suck in carbon dioxide as they're doing photosynthesis. And you learned this in the past, but you know this. They suck in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases that's heating up the planet. So if we let the trees do the sucking in of carbon dioxide like they're supposed to, we have less global warming. But when we cut down the trees, they're not there to do the sucking of the carbon dioxide and therefore the atmosphere is heating up and when that happens you are also accelerating the weather changes you're making ch changing the weather patterns because that has to do with the heat and the cold and because now the trees are not sucking in carbon dioxide the weather is changing it's getting warmer and more um, severe changes in the weather because we've, we're losing all of those trees out of the rainforest the question at the bottom um, <clears throat> asks us, what about our local ecosystems? What challenges do, do we face within our local ecosystems? And that's a pretty easy one to answer, me, being that we live here in Memphis. What if this part of the, the world was still natural, the what ecosystem is supposed to be happening here in Memphis would be a temperate deciduous forest, which those are the kinds where the leaves fall in the autumn, okay? The main types of animals we have here are deer and raccoon and squirrels. There would naturally be black bears and possibly uh, cougars. Um, those type of animals would naturally live here, and foxes and possibly, definitely, well, coyotes wouldn't be here, but they are now, but they shouldn't be. Um, foxes, definitely. Those type of animals should be here. The challenges we face is that so much of the city is paved over that we have very few natural areas left. That's one of the main problems that's happening in our ecosystem is that there's no ecosystem left. So within our chapter, this is what we're covering with the main ideas of the Earth's spheres. Okay, We're going to describe the four major spheres that help support life on Earth, the geosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the biosphere. Those are the four spheres that interact within the Earth. And we're going to understand how nutrients cycle within those spheres and how energy flows through the ecosystems. We're going to use these words, these key terms, the geosphere, atmosphere, trophosphere, stratosphere. Okay, Geosphere is the Earth. Atmosphere is the air. Trophosphere is the lowest level of the atmosphere. Stratosphere is the next level up. Then we're going to talk about hydrosphere, which is the water, and biosphere, which is the living things. And then after that, we're going to talk about the greenhouse effect and how that's actually the interaction of two or three or four, two or three or all four of the spheres together. Okay, greenhouse effect is actually all four of the spheres working together. 
as is some other things that we'll talk about in the chapter. All right, so um, the first thing is, is what are the four major spheres and how do they support life? These four spheres, the geosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere, they act as the Earth's life support system, okay? Um, they interact with each other. And then life is sustained by cycling nutrients and energy between and through these ecosystems. The nutrients that we need to live off of, all living things, not just humans, and the energy we need to live, the nutrients and the energy we need to live are cycled through these four spheres. So they act as the Earth's life support system based on the interaction of the four spheres, okay, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the geosphere, the biosphere, and our natural capital, the things we learned about all through chapter one, the natural capital, the resources, the ecosystem services, all of those things we rely on that the Earth gives us. Everything that the life depends on comes from the, um, it, the, is produced in these spheres and with the energy from the sun. So all of the natural capital, which we learned in last chapter, the resources, the ecosystem services, all of that stuff in the natural capital is produced within the four spheres, a combination of that plus the energy from the sun. All right, so um, this idea that the life support system is entirely included within these four spheres is because the Earth can be compared to a spaceship, okay? Spa they call it Spaceship Earth. Okay, Earth is traveling through space and it cannot dispose of its waste or take on new new supplies. Think about on a road trip. Okay, we are base the Earth is basically on a road trip through the universe, but there is no place for us to stop for gasoline or snacks or to go to the restroom. There's no place for us to stop. It's an endless road trip. Okay, we are stuck in this spaceship Earth. Everything we have, we do, we make stays right here. The only possible thing that's allowed in and out is energy from the sun. It comes in as light and it leaves as heat. That's the only thing. Energy is the only thing allowed in and out. All of the matter is stuck here. All right. So water is the earth is essentially a closed system with respect to matter. We can't just stop at the asteroid belt to pick up more oxygen. We can't go to Mars and get more water. That's not going to happen. Everything we have is contained here within the Earth. So as, a, as considering matter, matter, stuff, it's a closed system. Okay? It's an open system with respect to energy because sunlight can come in and certain amounts of heat can dissipate out. So it's an open system with respect to energy, but a closed system with respect to matter. Okay, so what this means is that the only thing that leaving, entering and leaving is the, the light and the energy from the sun. The only thing entering is solar energy and the only thing leaving in any amount is heat. And when we fill up the atmosphere, not even heat's going out that well. So this type of a closed system, it's like if you can imagine a terrarium and you'll have a worksheet where we do this too. Um, this type of closed system has some, some really potential problems. It's really easy to see, especially if you guys have ever been stuck on a road trip with your brothers and sisters in the back of the car. It gets uncomfortable really, really quickly if you get more populated. All right, the resources are limited. And as the population grows, okay, the resources are gonna get used up more and more rapidly. We only have just what's here. This is all we have. Okay, there's also the possibility that we're going to produce waste more quickly than we can dispose of them and trash the place up. Okay, so all of those things are a problem that we have with a closed system. Okay, so we have to be very, very aware of what's happening when we are handling our stuff. So within these four life support systems, this is all we have. The nutrients and the, the matter is transported and, trans, and moved from one area to the next throughout these four ecosystems. You have the air, which is the atmosphere, the water, which is the hydrosphere, the land, which is the geosphere, and the life, which is the biosphere. These four interact, okay, and this is how we, we send nutrients and matter throughout the earth. The geosphere is the first one we're going to cover, okay? It's the Earth's core, mantle, and crust, okay? Core, mantle, and crust. 
All right, and so all of the material above and below that forms the planet's mass. Now that's going to be important. This is what makes the Earth heavy, what gives it its mass, because with the Earth's mass, that's what holds our atmosphere on. It creates the gravitational force right there. It, the Earth's mass creates the gravitational force in order to keep the atmosphere here. It holds the atmosphere on because if you've ever seen enough, if you've ever studied space or, or seen some of the studies of whatever, the smaller planets almost never have an atmosphere because they're really light and the atmosphere floats off into space. It doesn't have enough mass to hold on to it. That's why the moon doesn't have any air. There's no air on the moon because the moon is so small. The air, and if there was any, escapes out into space. And so we, we, it is the Earth's mass that holds our atmosphere on. Otherwise, we wouldn't have anything to breathe. There wouldn't be any life without the mass of the Earth holding the atmosphere and the water on. The geosphere is also where we get all of our nutrients, okay, the carbon, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, um, all, calcium. All of the nutrients that we need to live come from the geosphere, okay? Calcium, nitrogen, phosphorus, all the vitamins and nutrients that we need to live comes from the geosphere. Also from the geosphere come our fossil fuels and our mineral resources. Those also come from the, from the earth. Now, we'll have an overview slide after each section. Oops, sorry. All right, and the overview slides are the ones you need to work on memorizing, okay? That's where the information is summarized, and this is where the main bits. So if you're going to memorize anything, memorize the overviews. So the geosphere is composed of a really hot core, a thick, mostly rocky mantle, and that very thin outer crust. It gives the planet its mass in order to keep the atmosphere from escaping into space. Like we said, this is what holds the atmosphere on. It contains all of the nutrients we need to live and our non-renewable fossil fuels, plus all of our mineral resources. Next up is our atmosphere. That's the second of the spheres. As we just said, <clears throat> it's held onto Earth by the gravity of the planet. The gravity of the geosphere helps hold it on. It is an, atmos it is an envelope of gases around the Earth. Okay that surrounds the planet. And if the Earth was the size of a basketball, the atmosphere would only be about as thick as a sheet of paper. Okay, so it's very, very thin. Think about the size of a basketball and put a piece of paper on top of it. That's about how thick the atmosphere is. There's not much. Okay, and all of the air we breathe is within it. This thin blanket of gases is also going to shield the planet from meteors. The meteors burn up in the atmosphere for us. Otherwise, we'd be full of craters like the moon is. Most of the meteors will burn up in the Earth as they come through. It also blocks most of the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. Do you see this right here? Let me put it a brighter color. Right here. The sun is putting off all sorts of crazy, difficult, dangerous radiation all the time. X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet rays that would burn your skin right off you. Okay, cancer in a second kind of stuff. Okay, the sun is putting that stuff off all the time. And the atmosphere helps protect us from the worst of that. Okay, so it protects us. And it also helps to regulate, let me back to red again. It also helps to regulate our climates. Okay, because you know, think about the earth. It's going to be hottest right here at the, the equator and coldest at the poles. But what the atmosphere does is it moves some of the heat from the equator and some of the cold from the poles, it moves the temperature, the heated air and the cooler air, it balances them out. Okay, otherwise the equator would be too hot to live and the poles would be too cold. So the atmosphere helps to move those temperatures and balance them out. Okay, and that's the only way that life can exist here in the troposphere. And we're going to talk, that's the lowest level. This is where we live. And this is what I'm talking about on the next slide, the troposphere. It is the layer where all weather occurs. Okay, all of the weather. And this is also the only layer in which we can live. Okay, it's the closest one down to the surface of the earth. Okay, the troposphere. It's thicker at the equator. Okay. At the equator, you have about 12 miles of atmosphere, okay? 
Um, up at the poles, though, it's thinner. You've only got about four miles of atmosphere at the pole, where you have 12 miles at the equator. Okay, and then life in the atmosphere has evolved to manage these temperatures and the composition of gases within the troposphere. So based on the amount, the types of gases we have and the temperature ranges we have, this is what life can live off of. The next layer up, the first one, here we go. The first one is a troposphere. That's where we live and where all weather happens. The next one up is called the stratosphere, okay, and it Within it, it has the ozone layer, which you've heard of before. <clears throat> you may not 100% know what it's for or what it does. So I'm going to go over that for you. The stratosphere is the atmosphere just above the troposphere. Okay, troposphere is where we are, where all weather is. Next layer up is the stratosphere. Nothing lives there. Okay, nothing can live in the stratosphere. But it's incredibly important for life on Earth because it contains the ozone layer. Now what ozone layer, it's O3. The oxygen we breathe, you know it's O2. Okay, that means two oxygen molecules stuck together. It looks sort of like a bar. Okay, uh, barbells where you have the oxygen with a connector between them. Okay, they look sort of like barbells. That's the stuff we breathe. Ozone is O3 and it's kind of set up in a triangle with an oxygen in all three points. It's set up like a triangle. And those ozone molecules O3, they'll connect to each other like a shield around the Earth in the stratosphere. And it shields us from the harmful ultraviolet radiation that I was talking about. The ozone layer protects us from the ultraviolet radiation. Now, people with skin as light as mine, we know that if you get too much ultraviolet radiation, we're going to get sunburned, we're going to get turned red, and it possible can lead to cancer. All right, so we put sunscreen on when we get out in the sun. The ozone layer is like global sunscreen. All right, it protects us from 95% of the ultraviolet radiation. I get burned really badly from only 5%. Okay, the, the ozone blocks 95. Only 5% of the ultraviolet can come in, and that's enough to burn me to pieces. All right, can you imagine what would happen if the full 95% came through? We'd all be burnt up, crisp, cancer in a minute. Okay, so the ozone layer protects us from the ultraviolet radiation. Okay, it acts as a global sunscreen, and it is found in the stratosphere. Okay. Now, the other three layers up, we have the mesosphere, the thermosphere and the exosphere, they all have their own portions. We're just not going to cover them. They all have their most important stuff, but um, they go for hundreds of kilometers up. Together, they help it to protect the Earth from the extremities of space. Space is full of radiation, and it's like negative 300 degrees out there. All right, so they help protect us. All right. So again, here's our overview slide for the atmosphere. Overview for the atmosphere. All right, the atmosphere is an envelope of gases surrounding the Earth. It helps to shield our planet from meteors and it blocks most of the harmful ultraviolet radiation. It helps to regulate the Earth's climate. Remember, it's hotter at the equator, colder at the poles, and the atmosphere will help distribute some of that heat and cold to balance things out. And it has five layers. The bottom innermost layer is a troposphere. This is where all life happens and all weather happens. The stratosphere is the next layer up. This is where the ozone is that protects us from UV rays. Then the other three, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. Okay, meso for middle. Okay, thermo for heat. That's the hottest one out there. And exo because you're just about exiting out into space. All right, so the, you're looking at here. So the question is, which layer of the atmosphere do we live in? It's the troposphere down here. Okay, within the troposphere is where all life is, where all weather happens. Do you see the clouds? And the airplanes can just barely get out to the stratosphere. Stratosphere is the next layer up. It has the ozone layer in it. All right, now if you look at this volcano, the reason this is here, the smaller volcanoes are going to spew their ashes here, but the biggest of the volcanoes can actually spew their ashes all the way out to the ozone layer. And what we found out 
the biggest of the volcanic eruptions can actually help to clog up the ozone hole. The biggest volcanic eruptions, now the small normal ones don't go up that high, but the biggest volcanic eruptions can help plug the ozone hole. And so what that means then is that if we leave the earth alone, she can heal herself. All right, moving on up, the mesosphere. This is where the meteorites were burned up. You know, there's always meteorites coming at our planet at all time. Usually they're small, okay? And usually they burn right up in the mesosphere, okay? That's what it does for us. It, this is where the meteorites burn up. And thermosphere is the next layer up. It's the hottest of all of them. But within the thermosphere, we have an, another layer called the ionosphere. This is where you'll see northern lights if you've heard about the northern lights that happen in Alaska and Canada, and there's also some down at the South Pole, too, where it's colder. The, the northern lights and the southern lights are created within the thermosphere, a special layer called the ionosphere, and that's where you get northern lights. The exosphere is exiting out into space. Okay, the molecules are so thin, they're almost non-existent, and this is where most of our satellites can fly. All right. Next layer is the hot next sphere is the hydrosphere and you know hydro means water okay and when we talk about the hydrosphere and I ask what's in the hydrosphere almost everybody can say lakes river and the ocean okay we can get these three with no trouble but what you also need to know is that we also have glaciers are included aquifers which aquifers are water that's buried deep in the ground and between holes between pores in the rocks and the aquifers are where we can tap with wells to get fresh water uh, water vapor is also included and the clouds are included so as we we can like I said we can always get lakes rivers and oceans but we need to also know that the, the hydrosphere includes glaciers aquifers water vapor and clouds it is all of the gaseous liquid and solid water that's on the surface okay gaseous means water vapor liquid and solid meaning ice anywhere on the earth's surface and when we think about the distribution of water where, where do you find the water well most of it as you can probably easily say hang on i got too many papers around you can easily say most of the water is found in the ocean okay we know this it contains about 96.5 of the total Earth's supply of water, and it covers about 71% of the Earth's surface. Okay, so that's almost all of the water that we have on Earth is found in the oceans. Okay, that's almost all of it. This tiny little section here, okay, less than 3% of the Earth's water is available as fresh water, and most of that is frozen in the ice caps and glaciers. Okay. We only get 3% as fresh water, and most of that is frozen. So here's our overview slide. All right. So the hydrosphere is all of the gaseous, liquid, and solid water on the surface. Okay. Okay, we know that it's lakes, rivers, and oceans, but it's also glaciers, aquifers, water vapor, and clouds. All right, so looking at our big picture here, up here at the top, all, this is all of the water on Earth, okay, up top. 95, 96.5% of the water on Earth is the oceans, and it covers 71% of the Earth's surface. This tiny bit here, this tiny bit here is our fresh water. Okay, let me maybe change color on that. This tiny bit here is our fresh water, okay, and most of it is locked up in ice, okay. Most of the fresh water is locked up in ice. We have this small portion here that we're allowed to use. This part of it is groundwater, like we said, in the aquifers, where um, we would tap that for wells. And there's this one section of stuff that's called other, okay? That's where we get our lakes, our rivers, this tiny bits rivers right here. And then this is swamps, which if we're gonna try to drink swamp water, we're gonna have to clean it first. All right, so what this is basically telling us is that we have very, very little fresh water to drink, okay? This, this is the, all we have, this tiny bit right here. This little section is all the fresh water we have. Oops. And then of most of that is frozen. 
this groundwater is in aquifers. We can tap that for wells. And then you have this little section here where this is in lakes, rivers, and this is in swamps. These uh, pictures here are in your book. They talk about the concentrations within the atmosphere first. Okay, within the atmosphere, I know when we think about the air we breathe, we automatically think of oxygen, right? But the oxygen is only about 21%. Most of the air we breathe is nitrogen, and that doesn't do us any good at all. We can't use nitrogen for anything, not in the air form. I mean, we use it to make our um, DNA. We use it for a lot of things if it's solid. But this gaseous nitrogen, this nitrogen gas, that's in the air, we can't really use it. Oxygen is only 20% of our air. This other tiny little bit right here, okay, this tiny bit, okay, this is where you have argon, which it doesn't, doesn't change heat, but this is where you get carbon dioxide that's causing our global warming. Take a look at how small this is. This tiny little bit down here, this tiny little bit is enough of the carbon dioxide, and over here, this other gases, this is methane, it's one of the other gases, E-T-H-A-N-E, -E, methane, is one of these other gases. Carbon dioxide and methane are the two main gases that are heating up our atmosphere that we hear about global warming all the time, but do you see how tiny amount that is? Nitrogen doesn't hold heat, and oxygen doesn't hold e heat, okay? The only ones that are holding heat are these tiny ones right here, and it's small, small amount causing all of that damage. That's why we have to be so careful because these gases are so powerful at warming. We, there's that much in the atmosphere causing so much damage. It's because they are so powerful. Okay, that's why we have to be so careful. Now moving here back to the water again. We think we've covered this pretty well. 96.5% of the water is salt water in the oceans. This fresh water is just this tiny little bit. Okay. All right. This much of it is groundwater. This much is frozen. And this tiny bit, that's the other stuff that's coming from rivers and lakes and swamps. Now, biosphere is uh, the last of our, um, biosphere is the last of our four spheres. Okay, bios means life. So this is the living part of the earth. Now it's also very small. If the earth was an apple, okay, the, the biosphere would be no thicker than the skin of that apple. Because I think you got a whole apple right here. And as thin as that skin off the apple is, that's the only place on the whole earth where life can exist. Think about it. You got a whole apple right here. The skin of the apple is the only place where life can exist. So the biosphere is very, very small. But within it, it consists of parts of all of the other four, the other three spheres. Atmosphere, hydrosphere, bio, geosphere, the biosphere contains parts of all of those others. It is the living part of any ecosystem. And it is very important, the important goal of environmental science is to understand the key interactions that occur within this thin layer of air, water, and soil, and how the human activities affect it. So what we try to do with environmental science is we try to understand how the living parts of the world interact with the air, the water, and the soil, so that when humans start to take place or take a part of it, we don't do too much damage. That's the whole port of environmental science. We have to figure out how the living parts of the world interact with the air, water, and soil so that when humans take part, we don't mess everything up. So here's the overview slide for biosphere. It is a very thin layer of air, water, and soil organisms. Okay, this is the living part. All right, and it consists of parts of each of the others parts of the atmosphere, parts of the hydrosphere, parts of the geosphere, anywhere on the world at all that life can exist. Now, we've talked about the four spheres together, the geosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere. Now we want to talk about, we said in the beginning that they act as the Earth's life support system. So this is how we learned what they were. Now we're going to learn how they support life on Earth, and they do that by interacting with one another. One of the best ways you can see them interacting is with the greenhouse effect. Now the greenhouse effect in the news nowadays sounds bad, 
but in general it's just a natural thing that helps warm up the surface of the planet without it the earth would be too cold to live so what happens is that the sunlight comes in okay energy from the sun comes in as light all right hits the surface the geosphere all right it hits the surface and bounces back up into the atmosphere as heat okay so the earth hits the land and the water so hydrosphere gets put in there too okay the sunlight hits the land and the water and it bounces back up into the atmosphere as heat all right and that is what keeps our planet from being too cold so it's a natural process solar energy comes in and it warms the trophosphere okay because it's reflecting off the earth's surface surface and interacting with the carbon dioxide and methane and water vapor from the hydrosphere and biosphere and all of the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere these interactions are part of this earth's life support system and without it the earth would be too cold to support life as we know it okay because without an atmosphere the earth is way too cold the atmosphere acts as our blanket because of the greenhouse effect now again the greenhouse effect is the sunlight coming in light energy comes in strikes the surface of the geosphere and the hydrosphere and bounces back up as heat into the atmosphere and that's what makes us stay warm so that we can have life here some more interactions is water filtration okay so some uh, more interactions are going to clean the earth's water and air okay for the water the plants are going to absorb the rainwater and water from the ground okay and as they do so they clean it and then through photosynthesis they send water back out water vapor and the water vapor that they send back out is clean so the rain comes down possibly dirty with um, acid rain or anything of that sort water comes up through their roots again possibly dirty from pollution or any of that sort it comes off the trees when they do transpiration clean all right the pollutants are absorbed also if you just have a puddle sitting here okay puddle sitting here and uh, this is what this next one's talking about as the I wanted blue as the Sun heats this puddle okay the puddle is part of the hydrosphere the puddle is sitting on the geosphere okay as the puddle evaporates into the atmosphere again we got all three of them all right as the puddle evaporates it comes off clean any water or pollutants that are in the puddle are going to stay or in the ocean or in the lake it doesn't just have to be a puddle any pollutants that are in the water as the water evaporates the evaporation comes off clean so it's filtered okay so the the particles that make the water impure are left behind the water evaporates off clean so that's the second part and the third part animals in the biosphere animals like clams and mussels they're like you know that you can eat like clams that you can eat for food they are going to filter impurities from the bodies of water they suck in dirty water as they're trying to get their food and they spit back out clean water so they actually clean the water and of course microorganisms all sorts of bacteria and other sorts of microorganisms are going to break down and clean the water and soil all the time and going to break down the contaminants in them so you have a whole lot of water filtration by uh, by different parts of the biosphere the plants the animals and then just simply the the interaction of just plain water evaporating now air purification is the next one that was water purification here's air purification it's mostly the trees forests will play a very important part in purifying the air the trees can absorb air polluting gases near the surface they will absorb air pollution and then again as they do their photosynthesis the oxygen comes off clean the water vapor comes out clean so they're absorbing these pollutants for us a single tree can produce enough oxygen for two people to breathe for a whole year one tree two people can breathe for a whole year and also it will absorb about four and a half kilograms of pollutants in a year so take a look at this graphic right here in one year a tree can cool like 10 air conditioners running continually All right, that's the main thing for here in Memphis especially in the summertime you know that in the country it feels cooler than it does in the sum in the city 
it literally is cooler in the country as it, than it is in the city because of these trees. The trees will cool like 10 air conditioner units running continually. Okay, that's one tree doing 10 air conditioner units. Also, it will absorb 750 gallons of storm water. Okay, 750 gallons of water that is usually polluted. They will absorb it all and send it out through water vapor in their leaves as clean. They will also filter over 60 pounds of pollutants from the air in one year, one tree. Can you imagine if we had, um, if each person planted seven or eight trees in their backyard, what difference we could make? All right, now here's the overview of the interactions. Okay, start the, the most one. When we, these again, the interactions are how we can see that the spheres give us our life support. So the greenhouse effect, the soil is, is energy is warming the trophosphere as it reflects back off the Earth's surface. It interacts with carbon dioxide, and that one is methane. CH4 is methane. M-E-T-H-A-N-E. -E. Okay, that's methane, CH4. Okay, so the it interacts with the carbon dioxide and the methane and water vapor, and without it, the Earth would be very is too cold to support life. Then we have the air and water purification, the living organisms, the plants and the animals like the mussels and the microorganisms. They're all going to absorb and filter pollutants from the water and soil. And then plain evaporation, just coming up off a puddle, is going to filter out water impurities. So all of those things, the spheres interacting, help us to um, help the life support system for our Earth. And so the question here is what gases help produce the greenhouse effect? We said it's carbon dioxide, CO2 and methane, CH4, and also water vapor. Water vapor can hold heat too. Okay, water vapor, vapor, not liquid. Water vapor will also help to hold the heat. And again, the way greenhouse works is the sunlight comes in as just light energy, hits the earth, and it bounces off as heat. Okay, so it's bouncing off the geosphere and bouncing off the hydrosphere into the atmosphere as heat. So you can see very easily all three, uh, all, of the, all of the spheres, because it's also the trees adding to this, trees and plants um, adding to this. So all four spheres are interacting. So I think that covers it, and we'll see you again when we do section two. All right, bye everybody.